three, two, one. Woo! All right, that's how I'm going to start today's show because I find myself battling with myself to be authentic. I want to put up this um, exterior of just being somebody different, somebody ha that just gets every line right. I'm looking at a cursor down here or at a teleprompter and thinking that I probably need to read everything just so, so I don't sound foolish in my delivery. That goes back to episode, episode one, which was um, just do it, analysis paralysis, trying to be perfect when everything gets out. And I find myself not talking to you. I find myself talking through you. And I have to work on that. I have to work on that and the ability to just be vulnerable enough to get my message out there in a way that it connects with you rather than me just always wanting to be this perfect delivered, uh, uh, a message of perfect delivery. Um, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be lumpy and chunky and it's going to have all these round edges, but hopefully what comes through is the heart of the message and the spirit of the message and that it's really there just to help you because the more I hear myself talk to you about what I'm going through, the more there's a chance that what I'm doing might impact you in a way that might honestly help someone. And that is something that I'm working really, really hard towards. So a lot of work goes into these episodes more than I ever imagined. And I am the type of person that I am willing to put in the work. I'll just keep working and, uh, and I make it part of the journey. And it's kind of like hiking. I always talk about hiking and how I run similar uh, paradigms on hiking and life. And you just don't know what's around the bend. So the more you get yourself out there and why in one way, shape or form, the more uh, wonderful experiences that you'll be opening yourself to. But at the same time, there'll be a uh, hurt, there'll be failure, there'll be falling down, and they'll probably more than likely, if you're lucky, they'll be getting up. And um, I just thought I'd start out with a big old scream so you see that I feel the same pain a lot of people do when they're paralyzed by fear or the fear of looking good or sounding great or just not looking foolish and seeming smart. I'm just as smart as you are. You're probably smarter than I am. It's all okay. We are who we are and we do the best we can with what we have within the journey that we've traveled. My journey is not unique. To me, it's different. Um, to you, yours is different, but it is unique to ourselves. And that's the only thing we draw from is that journey that we've been on. And the only lens that we see through is our own. So. It's just part of the process. So now, this is episode three of the Jerry Pujols Project 2.0. I wanna welcome you to this episode. First, we had episode one, which, is, which was named Just Do It. We then had episode two, which is um, basically an episode about leveling up. It's called Get, uh, Get It, uh, what was the name of that episode? Let me go look for it because I am going to look at my notes because I can't even remember the name of the last episode that I just did. That episode is called Getting Ahead. But what I like about one, two, and now three, um, these are going to play really well together. One leads to the other. They all kind of go hand in hand. Just doing it, getting over analysis paralysis is something that I've had to struggle with, possibly because of this idea of perfection and trying to get everything out there just right. But as I said before, I have a friend that reminded me that that just getting it done is better than perfect. Or what, what was her, no, what was her quote? Her quote was, better, done is better than perfect. I remembered. Done is better than perfect. And I'm going to keep that motto going throughout the rest of my life because sometimes you get so wound up by just making sure everything is just so beautifully delivered, so beautifully edited, that then people will think that you're just that much smarter because 
you actually don't make a single mistake as you speak and deliver this information that should be touching everyone's heart. Oh, what a mouthful. So, done is better than perfect. That was um, the, uh, the uh, premise of uh, just doing it, getting ahead and continuously growing, basically leveling up was episode two. And now on ep episode three, we're gonna talk about I'm just sc scrolling to my teleprompter people so bear with me basically the premise of today is really a should be an easy one for me to talk about is how I lost 40 pounds in eight weeks so 40 pounds in eight weeks seems like a crazy thing doesn't seem realistic some of you might think oh this is just water weight or what did he do did he starve I'm gonna tell you right now I did not starve if anything I ate more than I've ever eaten I'm still deep in my recovery uh, to food addiction and deep in the journey of health and I am really really enjoying that so if anything I say um, impacts you um, then I've done my job that that's really it if it just kind of gets you motivated to think about your health nutrition and things like that I think I think that um, my mission will be done if it at least touches somebody out there so that's why I'm putting this time into this and and enjoying the the chunkiness of the process um, I want to talk about um, a little bit of housekeeping one thing that would help and would encourage me and continuing to make these videos is if you subscribe or hit us give us a nice little like uh, there's also a little bell in there and if you hit that it'll tell you when the next one comes out my goal is to do one of these uh, per week I'm trying to be a good steward and do them launch them every Sunday so I have a nice cadence going between building the material um, uploading uh, up uploading uh, the recording editing and then we go into the production of building a thumbnail and there's so much that goes into these things more than I ever imagined but my goal and my promise to use that by Sunday there'll always be a new one so here's me sticking my neck way out there and saying that because as I say that to you I say that to myself and I hate disappointing myself that's the one person I really hate disappointing. And then, second, I hate disappointing you because there's a fear to that as well. So yes, please, subscribe, like, hit the little ring button, and support me as much as you can. And uh, I would do my very, very best to put out content that hopefully moves you in some way and helps you uh, get unstuck if you find yourself stuck in any area. I always would welcome for you to give me any um, suggestions that you can, any questions that you want to ask me, put them in there, send them to me, and I will do my very best to get right back to you. I'm pretty good about that. There's a lot of OCD involved in getting back to people. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy episode number three. I hope you have time to watch this entire podcast because I'm gonna be sharing with you a little bit about my journey with weight, food, and, and the many challenges I've had throughout my life with, uh, with weight. However, at the end, I will share with you any and all of the resources that I've stumbled upon that have helped me get this far and move me towards recovery. Also, a little disclaimer, I'm not a doctor, any kind of physician, uh, neuropathic doctor, therapist, psychologist, I'm none of those things. So please um, confirm anything you hear with your doctor and any advice when it comes to nutrition or making any modifications to the way that you eat and workouts and all those things included that I'm doing right now. Uh, make sure you check with your doctor. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the origin of my battle with weight. I'm a Hispanic guy uh, born from a Cuban 
father and a Puerto Rican mother. And I can remember way back when my Puerto Rican grandmother used to love to get her grandkids together and cook for us. And what was interesting is that we learned early on that if you ate one plate, you'd make her much happier by eating a second plate. It didn't stop there. Then it would become a contest. Then we'd just go on eating rallies. And the more we ate, the happier she was. And that was a theme in my Puerto Rican side of the family. So you clearly show your love by, by, feeding, by feeding someone. And boy, did she do that well, because she cooked foods with so much flavor, so much love was poured into them. So then beyond that, I, um, I remember how she would, I remember the warm feeling I would get when she would just say, boy, you're, you're the best eater. You know, the minute she would say you're the best eater because I can eat the most, I can out eat my cousins. I remember how good I felt. And, and you know, some of those things stay with you forever. I'm clearly not blaming my grandmother for any of that. You know, my grandmother had her own issues. My grandmother was a child of the depression. Uh, my grandmother was separated from her siblings at a very young age. You know, these, these, these kids uh, were being, you know, split up because there wasn't enough to go around. So she comes from a place that the struggle was so real that the way that she ended up showing love was by making sure that the abundance of food that was there was shared and there was always enough to go around. So that was on my, on my mother's side of the family. Now, we go to my Cuban side of the family. It was different. You know, those guys, when Fidel Castro took over in 1959, um, everything became uh, scarcity. Everything was rationed. You know, they would get so much uh, rice per month, so many pounds of beans per month, so much coffee, so much sugar, so much anything, so many pairs of shoes, which I think was one pair of shoes a year. Um, and, it, and there was no guarantee that you were going to get more. Just because you got something doesn't mean that the recurring plan was going to work out and you were going to get the rice next month or the chicken or the meat or whatever it is that they would be rationed. So, you know, I, I kind of understand now where she was coming from, but as a, you know, 10 or 11 year old kid living in her house, I was, I was a kid that couch surfed, you know, my dad and my mom were divorced. So I would, I would live on my grandmother's house, sleep in her couch in Puerto Rico. Then I come to my grandmother's house, sleep in her couch in Miami. Then I would go over to a, a cousin's or an uncle's house and sleep in their couch at another place in Miami. And that was my life from the time I was about 10 years old and my parents had divorced. But my Cuban grandmother ran a house with not a lot in the cupboards. You know, there was no, never a lot of food there. It was very rationed in the way that she inventoried what she was going to cook for tonight, what she was going to have for tomorrow, and very, very, very rationed. And I remember, again, at 11 years old, being hungry in the middle of the night, grabbing something to eat out of the fridge. And when I heard her come out of her room, I was, my grandmother was a big woman, you know, she was very overweight uh, at that time. And she would kind of just waddle out of her room and I can hear her, uh, I can hear her sandals hitting the tile floor. And I remember I just threw whatever I was eating into the trash. And she comes in and turns on the light and says, what are you doing? I said, nothing. She goes right into that garbage can and pulls out whatever it is that I was eating and confronts me. I remember that how I felt when she uncovered that. I remember that she, yeah, I just, I, I didn't even know how to process that. I was like, what did I do wrong if I was hungry and I'm eating something that was in the fridge? But for her, the most important thing is that 
there was food the next morning for my grandfather before he went to, to his ranch. There was food there. Um, so if I ate something that would get in the way of that, it was, there, there was something negative going on with, with taking something away from my grandfather. Maybe my dad was going to come by the next day and bring me breakfast, but I had done something really, really bad. So I remember from then on out, I would literally get change. And if there were quarters around or if I would, I would change uh, back in the day when you can turn in Coke bottles and get change for them. I would exchange the Coke bottles for quarters and then I'd build up a little stash of change and, and I'd go to the pastry store up the street from her house, like four blocks away there was a, a pastry shop that, sa- that, was, that sold Cuban pastries. And if you haven't had Cuban pastries and you want to do something bad for yourself, have Cuban pastries. These were like guava and cream cheese pastries that they're super punchy on your taste buds so you can easily get addicted to them and I remember I would get six of those things at a time and and I eat every single one of them on the way back home just to spider just because I wasn't going to share that food with her. I would share it with my uncles, I would share it with my grandfather, I'd share it with anybody but I wouldn't share it with her. And that was kind of the beginning of that type of behavior around food that just kind of just kind of led me down this road of an obsession with with eating. So, you know, I'm just thinking and processing you know, why, why is it that I am the way that I am? And why has it been so many years of such a battle with, with my relationship with, with food? So through all that couch surfing um, and the instability and the environment uh, I was growing up in, I never knew where I was going to be sometimes the next day. And I certainly didn't have a clue where my next meal was coming from. So that kind of starts to add to that story. So fast forward a few years, I'm now in middle school. And at this point, I was taking a serious interest in in girls. Don't get me wrong, I think I had an interest in in girls from the time I was four or five years old, but that's that's not anything to brag about. But by the time I was in middle school, I really started to take an interest in girls. And and I also noticed that that interest wasn't reciprocal. You know, I'm not getting that, that, that attention back. And, and you know how, how, how it happened for me? I also confirmed that because I, I remember asking a girl, her name was Lily. I remember asking Lily if she would be my girlfriend. We were always flirting and this and that, and it felt like the right thing to do. Socially, it felt like, okay, I can ask her to be my girlfriend. And, and, and Lily said to me, you know, Jerry, I cannot be your girlfriend. And I said, why? She says, you're just too chubby. And I thought, wow. She says, you know, if you just lost some weight, you have a real pretty face. If you lost some weight, um, I'd be your girlfriend because then I wouldn't be embarrassed at what other people thought of me having a chubby boyfriend. And she was flat out blunt. And ironically, we stayed friends. And uh, she was the uh, coolest person ever, but she was going to let me have it the way that she saw it. And, uh, and that did do something. And, and from there on, I, I remember uh, I started doing what a lot of kids my age were doing at the time, you know, lifting weights, uh, running. I started to do all these things, but I couldn't outrun food. You know, I could lose weight, but I can feel the weight is always just on my heels because no matter how how much I lifted, how hard I worked out, how much cardio I did, I remember how, you know, it would make a little bit of impact, but never enough. And then from there, I thought, well, let me me get into some books and let me see, I, I know I have to do something. It has to be what I eat, it's not the workout. So I ran into the Scarsdale diet uh, that book, if, if you're my age, you know, you probably remember is one of the fad diets of that time back in the late 70s, early 80s. We're probably going into the early 80s here. So I was around 17. 
and I read that book and I started to follow some of that protocol. I can, I can tell you, I don't even remember what the diet was about, but whatever I was doing was working because I went from 200 and something pounds, I think I went to like the 180s and my waist went down to about 31, 32. And, and then I was getting, you know, the attention of girls and, um, and that led me to believe that I was on the right track. But no matter how, how much I did, I have to tell you that I always felt like the fat kid was still inside. I still felt like I'm running away from something that's just snowballing, that's literally on my back about to take me down. And, you know, at, at 17 years old, I moved to New York City. I actually uh, did some commercial modeling. I was getting a lot more attention to do, uh, you know, magazine covers. I did a couple of them and I did a couple of uh, photo shoots for, for actual modeling agencies that wanted to promote um, their agencies. And I was the face of one of them at one time in New York City. And there was a time where, man, I thought I escaped this nightmare because my face was on almost every single bus stop in New York City and probably 1986. And with that being said, um, I still felt like the only way I can stay that way was by starving, literally by not eating anything. And, and I remember in New York City, there was times that I would eat, you know, a pack of M&Ms in a day because I thought the M&Ms uh, were enough protein to sustain me because we start to believe that protein is the end all be all. I'm here to tell you that for those of you who believe pr protein is the end all be all, talk to, your to, talk to your doctor and ask them the last time your doctor ever ran into a protein, protein deficient individual, if that's ever even happened. I'm here to tell you right now that if we're deficient of one thing and one thing only, it's fiber. Over 97% of us are fiber deficient. Only 3% of us are getting enough fiber per day. And here we're asking, are we getting enough protein? We better eat a lot of meat and chicken and fish to get our protein. And we're all being misled, but I'll get more into that a little later. So, you know, by this point, as I mentioned, I went to New York City. I had left my dad's house for the last time. I was 15 years old when I left my dad's house for the last, for the last time, because I tried leaving a few times before. And for some reason, I've always looked up to my dad. Not that he was an example that I should have looked up to, but I was very confused and I thought he was the, the person that I wanted to be like. And that's not the case. But with that being said, I made it my mission to leave that house for the last time um, and started working. He, you know, he taught me how to run heavy equipment from the time I was 12, 13 years old. So by the time I left my house at 15 years old, dropped out of the 10th grade of school, started running a bulldozer and making enough money to pay my own way. And, and that's been my life ever since. I've, worked, I've paid my own way and I've built myself. And, and now I'm fortunate enough that, that I get to live a, a pretty amazing existence because of the treasury and embracing doing hard things. So this is a hard thing that I'm in the middle of right now again. And again, I want you to just kind of take in the information and see where it applies to you because I really hope it helps you if you're stuck in any way or dealing with weight. I hope this inspires you in some way to help you you know, with, with this thing, especially if you have this fat person inside that just really has a hard time leaving you. You know, for me, it was hard at 15 years old to figure out whether paying rent or buying groceries was, you know, was, was, it was on the balance and I always struggled with, you know, what comes first. So I would always pay the rent first and food was always second. So I continued this, this paradigm of uh, scarcity, scarcity, scarcity. And that just kind of, the more I would hold on to scarcity, the less I would eat, the more I would come up with lack of nutrition and struggled with that, with binging anytime I got an opportunity. So binging became the new normal. I would just binge anytime I could. So binging was a nightly thing because then binging became medicinal. 
<coughs> so although at 17 years of age I had lost most of the weight, I can still tell that it's on my heels and, and, and at any moment I knew I'd slip on a banana peel. And, and that did happen. It started to really happen right before I met Susan. I met Susan when I was 19 or 20 years old in Napa, California. And it was one of those love at first sight. I saw it, the first thing I told myself at 19 years old was I could marry somebody that, that looks like that. And then when I spoke to her, I knew I could marry somebody that spoke like that. And by the time uh, I was 20, I was engaged. By the time I was 21, we were married. And, um, and here we went. But one interesting thing that I love saying is that, that Susan became my one um, pillar of stability. Susan became the one thing that gave me a foundation that was not built on quicksand. Anything I had done up to that point was built on a foundation that was built on quicksand. Uh, Susan offered stability. She was a Napa girl, born and raised here. She did not believe in moving from state to state, picking up, leaving, doing everything that I had done my entire life up to that point. And that was helpful for me because it was clearly something that, that I needed. But one thing that, it, that I did was um, I started to really medicate with food. You know, shortly within three, four years, Susan and I had a total of four kids. So we were raising four kids. Um, I was working day and night. By the time I was 23, uh, I took $300 and built a, a large produce company, a distributorship up out of the San Francisco Produce Terminal. So I started with $300 produce business and about eight years was selling over $20 million a year worth of produce because I was used to grinding. I was used to just going out there and, and doing it and making it happen. But clearly I was putting myself last. Uh, I wasn't taking care of myself and I was just surrounded by this bounty of produce, fruits, vegetables and all that. And on my way to San Francisco, I was stopping by Jack in the Box or by Taco Bell to eat some of that food. I remember drinking an entire big gulp with, a, um, with an apple fritter. We call those door stoppers. I would eat an apple fritter and a big gulp of Mountain Dew. And by the time I'd get to, uh, to uh, San Francisco in my warehouse, I'd feel like my heart was going to explode. And I did that for, for a long time. So then the weight started to, to stack and just started to affect me. You know, if you're used to yo-yoing, uh, and if you've yo-yoed, um, I'm sure you can relate to going up 20, 30 pounds. For me, my yo-yo is 50 to 75 pounds, 50 pounds up, 50 pounds, pounds down. But when it gets really scary is when I start getting over 270. I I'm only five foot nine. So at five foot nine, 270 pounds, it's a 42 inch waist. And that's really what I'm coming off of right now. I'm coming off of probably closer to 280 pounds. I stopped this by the time when I see 270, I just won't, shot, won't jump on the scale anymore. So I could have been 280, 290. I don't know. But it's something that, you know, it really affected me. I want to tell you a little bit about some of the diets that I've tried, because maybe some of you can relate to this. I, I told you earlier that I started with the... Um, with the Scarsdale diet, but I have a list here of the ones that I've tried. I've tried Atkins, Weight Watchers, South Beach, remember that one? Jenny Craig, Keto. I've done the Mediterranean diet, all meat. Raw food, vegan. I've gained weight on raw food, vegan diet, if you can believe that. The Mediterranean diet, Body for Life, remember that one? That one, I got down to 10% body fat and I still have pictures to prove it. I got very lean. Susan actually did the, the plan with me. She, doesn't have, she does not ever need to lose weight, but she got leaner. She actually modeled for, for Harbinger, these boxing gloves that, that, um, that are used for working out and hitting the bags. 
So we did that for a while. Um, let's see, I did the zone diet. Remember the zone? Eat for your blood type. I've, did, I've done that. Paleo, Nutrisystem, grapefruit diet, cabbage soup diet. I've done juice fasting. I've even gone to Overeaters Anonymous. Because I clearly, at some point, it really hit me that it was an addiction. So now here are some of the things that I've tried instead of dieting. I've done hypnosis, acupuncture, I've done therapy, cardio, hiking, cycling, and anything else that's physical under the sun. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sure there are a ton more I can't remember. Like I said, I've never been able to outwork or outsmart my food addiction. I've also always bragged about the fact that nor drugs, recreational drugs, prescription drugs, or alcohol have ever had a hold on me. I brag about that as if I'm winning, but I'm not admitting that I am a food addict. But then some years ago, I came to the realization that food, for some reason, calmed my nerves. Especially at the end of the day, you know, you have four kids at home, they're screaming, Susan's stressed out, she's been working all day at, in the house, making sure that, you know, four school, schools are delivered in the morning, four schools are picked up in the afternoon, and, and then we split in different directions. I would go take them to baseball. She'd take her to ballet. I mean, it was just like that for years and years and years. So I continued to self-medicate with food. A full stomach in the evening for me, it's really always been the only way that I've been able to um, decompress. You know how people grab a glass of wine and sometimes with one glass of wine, they're able to just kind of chill. That was it for food. But for me, it's not just a little bit of food, it's binging. If I binged, then if I felt like my blood pressure was dropping and I felt calmer. Talk about getting it all wrong. And you know, the one thing that I never realized is that the more I ate later in the evening, the less sleep I was getting in the middle of the night. I'd get up at 11 o'clock at night, sometimes 12, sometimes one o'clock in the morning. And I would think that that was good because it gave me the space to work quietly. But what it was robbing me of was sleep. And I'll tell you later how it's all come full circle for me because I sleep eight or nine hours a day now without fail and I get the best sleep I've ever had. I mean, I'm telling you the best sleep I've ever had, and I'm going to give you the conclusion as to how all this happens. You know, the other thing that I've run into over the years is that most MDs don't know much about nutrition. I've also ran into the fact that a lot of nutritionists don't know much about nutrition and how to take the addiction because they're not, they're thinking that for most people, they're thinking that overeating is the problem because they're not linking it to addiction. For a lot of people, when you remain overweight for long periods of time, you really have to ask yourself if you're addicted to the foods that you're eating. Are they prepackaged? Are they salty? Are they savory? Are they sugary? what's going on you have to dig deep into that to get to the cause of why you keep doing it because you know we keep jumping on the scale or we keep seeing ourselves in the mirror and we just don't stop it just keeps going so doctors are not where i would go to get my advice when it comes to how to make healthy choices because most of the time the the advice that doctor is going to give you is going to be in the way of a pill i'll tell you a little bit about that in a few minutes um I went to, a, it was about three, four months ago, I went in, no, I'm not, I'm not right, hold on, it was in November, five months ago. I went into, uh, a little bit less than five months ago, sorry, I'm still trying to be perfect here. Um, I went to get a physical, 
And the first thing that I noticed when I went to get my physical, I jumped on the scale and I want to say it was 274, 275 pounds. So that already uh, put me in a mood. And then I go in to see the doctor. They take my blood pressure. My blood pressure is high enough to where they want me to come back the next morning. They thought I might be going through something that's called white coat syndrome. White coat syndrome is when somebody goes to the doctor and just when they see a white coat, they, their heart rate goes up because they're nervous that they're at the doctor's. I've never had that, so I never get nervous around doctors or needles or anything like that or the smell of alcohol. So I did the math in my head. I'm like, okay, over 270 pounds. Um, I haven't been working out. I'm eating like garbage. I'm drinking alcohol, which is something that I don't do much of, but I know I was you know, having a few cocktails a week. Um, what else? you know, doing very little to take care of myself. They want me to come back the next morning. What am I expecting to hear tomorrow that I'm not hearing today? I'm afraid of what, what I'm going to hear. And then I'm afraid of what the doctor's going to say because I know what they're going to say. If your blood pressure is up, it's easy. We can fix that with a pill, a fucking pill. You know? I, I, I'm just so sick of that, you know, that it's just all about a pill. So I refused the idea of going back. So I, I didn't go back. I knew that I was going to dive in. And I knew that I was going to have to do the work. I just didn't know what it looked like. So I started researching. As I went down that wormhole, I researched um, and ran into a Penn Gillette. I don't know if you know who that is. Penn is part of Penn & Teller. They have a show in the Rio Hotel in Las Vegas. And Penn did something called the potato diet. Potato diet, I thought. Okay, let me listen to this crazy thing I listened to. I listened to this potato diet thing and Penn just swears by it. He's like, man, it saved my life. He says, I've lost over a hundred pounds. I, I feel amazing. I mean, he was literally knocking on death's door. Everything pointed in that direction, but he went all in, he did this potato diet. And I thought, well, I can do that. I can do a potato diet. I've done a juice fast before. It's helped me reset, lost a lot of weight. Um, you know, I, I knew, I knew I felt good eating uh, vegetables, fruits and vegetables, and, and just drinking them, that, that felt good. It just, the one thing that I realized that with the juice fasting, it, was, it wasn't sustainable. I, by day eight, I snapped and I just went back to eating foods. But then I, what it did is it reset my palate and then the food that I was eating uh, tasted better. And then I found myself eating healthier foods. So for a couple of years, I stayed pretty lean. I stayed in the in the high 100s, you know, not the 270s. I was probably 190, 195, and that just felt way better. So I recalled that and I thought, well, if I would consider doing something as extreme as a potato diet, because I know a potato, only eating potatoes for weeks, like he did, uh, to where he lost 100 pounds doing it, I think that would have such a negative effect on my relationship with food that I thought, that's probably just not for me. And maybe because I wasn't on death's door like he was, it wasn't as drastic for me to make that type of extreme decision. So I just thought, well, why don't I eat just, uh, why don't I just eat healthy? Why don't I just eat healthy? Why don't I just cut out the meat? I, I know red meat, chicken and fish cause cancer. I, I, well, the fish, I don't know as much, but I know it has a lot of mercury and you can only eat so much. Then you have red meat. Uh, it's been proven to cause cancer, number one. Uh, and then it goes down the road of saturated fats, clogging your arteries, all the things that red meat does because they tell you to eat very little meat, maybe once a week. And then chicken, if you've seen the process of, of cultivating and growing and, and slaughtering chickens, and that, it's probably the most gross. I mean, people think pigs are foul. Uh, really look at chickens and how they, how they get treated and, and tell me that you don't think that's disgusting, but... But I thought, well, maybe, maybe just going back to something simpler. 
So I recalled a book that I ate uh, that I I recall a I recall a book that I read a long time ago by Dr. Joel Furman. The name of the book was Eat to Live. I read this book when I had the produce company. I had all the all the ingredients available to me, but I wasn't ready to take in that information because I knew it would come at a price. The price was not eating at some of the fancy restaurants that I get to eat at. Because, you know, when you're selling produce to some of the best restaurants in the world in the Napa Valley, you get to go to the, you get to visit those restaurants and everything is a reduction sauce. Everything is a hidden calorie. Everything's hidden salt. Everything's hidden sugar. If you only knew what was in your food at restaurants, you'd think twice whether you should be eating that or not, especially if you're struggling with weight. But we don't. We just combine, uh, we just justify eating at these restaurants because of the flavors and we don't realize that we keep going back because we're addicted to something that really affects our palate, taste buds, in such a way. So Dr. Joel Furman talks about nutrition calorie dense foods versus, well, I said it wrong, let me go again. He talks about calorie dense foods versus nutritionally dense foods. Think about that. What should somebody like me or like you be eating? Nutritionally dense or calorie dense? I think nutritionally dense wins hands down, right? So consider changing the way you eat and never feeling hungry. That was the one thing that I, I remember doing Jenny Craig for about 24 hours. And I was thinking, oh my God, I, I'm gonna eat 900 calories and then be expected to be clear enough the next day to think? And that packaging and that food and the sugar, the salt, the oil. Oh, I forgot to mention Octavia. That's the last diet that I did. I forgot to mention Octavia. And I remember saying to my coach, you know, I don't want to eat anything out of a box. And my coach, who's the sweetest woman in the world, said, no, but if you eat it out of the box, the food is pretty good. I'm telling you, Jerry, because my husband is a chef and he says the food is pretty good. I'm here to tell you nothing in a box is good. Nothing in a box is good. You know, stop selling that lie. That's part of, pop, that's what's killing us. The only reason we have cavities, the only reason we have heart attacks, the only, one of the reasons we're getting the cancers that we're getting is from the foods that we're eating that are all in a box. So stop selling something from a box as if it was good for you. I hope she, he, she hears this. So one thing that Joel Furman says, he has an acronym called G-Bombs. Joel Furman says that we should be eating G-Bombs every single day of the week. What does G-Bomb stand for? Greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, and nuts. That's it. Simple as that. You know, we can grains, complex carbohydrates, sweet potatoes, things like that are included, but you don't have to eat those every day. One thing that you do have to eat every day are greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, and nuts. If you want optimal health, if you want to be eating at the top of your game, if you want to be eating and consuming the very best foods. So what I haven't told you is that I started eating uh, the way Joel Furman um, said in the book, and that's by eating the G-bombs. And I'm limiting you know, the amount of nuts that I would eat a day because I don't go crazy on nuts. I don't go crazy on avocados. I don't go crazy on some of the things that I can eat more of, but I limit them. <coughs> and that's how in two months I dropped 40 pounds. I just literally melted 40 pounds off my body and not in water weight, not in muscle, not in anything. Literally 40 pounds of fat have disappeared from my body. I still have another 40 or 50 pounds to go to get to the optimal desired body weight that's recommended for somebody that's five foot nine inches tall, which is between 160 and 170 pounds. 
So I'm in the middle of my journey, deep into the middle of my journey. I probably lost close to 50 pounds now. And I can tell you that by shifting the way that I eat, it's had an impact on my taste buds. So I'll go into this a little bit with you. Things didn't really change for me till I picked up on the fact that Joel Furman suggests that we eat SOS free. SOS stands for sugar, oil, and salt. Sugar, oil, and salt are the trap that most of us who struggle with weight are in. Think about that, sugar, oil, and salt. You know, a lot of you and a lot of me justified olive oil. I would literally drink olive oil from a spoon because I love the flavor of it so much. The amount of calories in a tablespoon of olive oil is exorbitant. And the amount of tablespoons that we put on a salad are over the top. So we can, we can literally eat a thousand calorie salad with olive oil and avocados and nuts. And then we throw some feta cheese in there and then it just becomes more and more and then we're eating a 1500 calorie salad. That's not nutrient rich, that's calorie dense. So we need to back some of those things out. We need to back some of those things out and eat food the way it was intended to be consumed. Less complicated. <laughs> We're so addicted to, to the processed foods, I tell you. When we eat out, we are so impressed by reduction sauces. I mean, there's something called a sous chef. The sous chef works on sauces and the sauces are designed to trick our brains into thinking that we're putting something so wonderful into our mind, into our mouths, that we get a dopamine hit as if we were a drug addict, and now all of a sudden we're happy because we got a dopamine hit just literally through our taste buds. We're being fooled in a big way. Let me read this to you. Our taste, our taste buds. Our, ta our taste buds are tiny sensor organs on our tongue that send taste messages to our brain. These organs have nerve endings that have chemical reactions to the foods we eat. With how many taste buds humans have, you're able to sense a range of flavors across five categories. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and savory. My food addiction led me down a path where I discovered a book called the Pleasure Trap. For me, The Pleasure Trap was a game changer. The authors of this book, Dr. Alan Goldhammer and Dr. Doug Lyle, did an amazing job explaining how most, most of us are stuck in the pleasure trap. They say there are two things that humans in our evol evolution constantly seek, food and sex. Food for survival, sex for procreation. Now, I love it when Dr. Goldhammer said the other day, he says, but for men, it's sex and food. It's just a little different, a little joke, take it easy. So, you know, think about this. How can any of us think that consuming something like Coke or Pepsi can do anything but hurt us? Why are we drinking that? It's literally working on the pleasure trap. It's really hitting that dopamine in our brain and giving us that hit as if it was as if we're drinking something that's a drug that gives us this pleasure sense that we just are so overwhelmed and overjoyed by we keep going back you know how can any of us think that frosted flakes are part of a balanced breakfast y you know how can any of us think that you know going into taco bell and getting a six pack of little tacos or Dorito shell tacos are something that is, that is actually helping us by giving us calories that are sustaining us in the way that they should be. Start thinking about the things that you eat. Once you get to a place where you understand why we are led into this trap then, then, that we cannot escape from, then we start to make more sense out of this whole thing. We're being held against our free will, hostage by food. Food that's highly processed and stripped from all nutrient. And we keep going back for more. But 
For you to understand this, you have to do your own research. You have to take some of the names that I'm dropping in, in my message as things that you start writing down and then you go in and you start listening to some of these talks. You start doing some of the research. You start reading some of the med medical uh, findings that are out there because they're public for you to see. This is why I'm so happy to report that as we speak, I continue to melt fat in a way where I'm not missing those things because, you know, I'm going to explain in a couple of minutes how long it takes to get this out of your system. You know, it's going to take some discipline. It's going to take some discipline, but I promise you, it's going to leave your system. Your taste buds are not going to require those shitty foods anymore. I still have, a, like I said, another 40, 50 pounds left to lose. And, and I know this way, I'm, my, I'm on my way towards a sustainable way of living. You know, at this point, I'm working out with weights three days a week. I do four saunas a week because saunas have been proven to really help fight against heart disease. And I get some cardio in every single day. I walk my dogs twice a day, once in the morning in the freezing cold, once in the evening in the freezing cold. And the reason I'm doing that is because it calms them down, but guess what? It calms me down as well. The one thing that I haven't told you yet is that I've taken the whole SOS Free Living uh, acronym to a whole other place by adding SOS C Free Living to the way that I'm living. And the C stands for caffeine. The day that I decided to go SOS free, I stopped drinking coffee or anything caffeinated. I'm a person that suffers from anxiety, anxiety attacks, and I have to take one pill every single day called Paxil, and I take 30 milligrams of Paxil. And I've been taking that for over, or close to 20 years, or right around 20 years. The doctors believe that I should remain on Paxil because I don't suffer from any of its side effects. One of the side effects of Paxil is weight gain. But now I debunk the fact that weight gain is at least a side effect for me. It's not because I can lose weight while I'm on Paxil. But Paxil allows me, because some medicine is good, Paxil allows me to just continue to be able to function because if I stop taking Paxil, the side effects are vicious. The doctors warn me of that. But with that being said, is the one drug that keeps me from getting those panic attacks. And I want to do one of the upcoming episodes on anxiety and panic attacks for any of you that suffer and struggle with that. But the one thing I can share with you, and hear this, if you eat better, the anxiety drops. If you stop taking in caffeine, the anxiety drops you start to become a different person and you actually are calmer. If your outside doesn't seem calmer to other people, your insides are way calmer and that feels really good. So I hope this helps you in some way. You know, something that's challenging and I just discovered it is eating this way when you travel. I just went to a real estate, I'm in real estate, uh, in the Napa Valley and I went into a real estate conference in LA or Long Beach uh, a few weeks ago and I thought it was going to be impossible to go to a conference and eat SOS free, non-processed, all whole plant-based eating. And by the way, whole foods, plant-based eating doesn't mean impossible burgers. Uh, that's garbage too, just so you know, that's a highly processed food. It's not good for you. Some of us might think it is because it, they bleed like a burger, they bleed beet juice. It's not only beet juice, there's a lot more than beet juice in that blood that comes out of a processed uh, plant-based food. And things that are called plant-based, be careful, read the ingredients because there's a ton of garbage in them. But one thing that I did do, I thought, well, I'm just gonna treat this like a hiking trail. I'm gonna take a big suitcase, I'm putting a blender in it and I'm taking the produce with me. And I sort of put my journey out on Facebook and, and people started giving me grief because they're like, well, there's probably a Whole Foods close to your hotel, Jerry. You don't need to pack lettuce. I packed the lettuce. I wasn't going to take a chance. But they were right. I will give this to them. It would have been much easier to go to Whole Foods, just have the blender in the room and make my smoothies and then make myself a salad and go that way. But shortly after that trip, 
I met up with my friends in Las Vegas, which is a very challenging place to diet because everything is a buffet and everything is just rich and decadent. And I'm happy to report that on this trip, I took my much smaller blender. I took an Uber over to Whole Foods, got all the fruits, vegetables that I needed, brought them back to my room and made myself the most amazing salads, the most amazing smoothies. And while I was in Vegas, while I was in Las Vegas, people, I lost two more pounds. So it goes to show you what could be done when you really start taking care of yourself first. This wasn't about my buddies and not hanging out with them. I went out to the restaurant with them. I ordered myself a plain salad and I just noshed on the salad without any dressing. I put lemon on it, but I was already full from everything I ate in the room. And then afterwards, we went to a show and after the show, I went back to the room and made myself a smoothie. You have to want to take care of yourself first and then you can be there for them in a different way, in a different capacity. But you don't have to be the guy, you know, eating what they're eating. What was really a lot of fun to watch is how interested all of these guys were in what I was doing and how I think it may have inspired a couple of them to think differently about the way they were eating. So that was really fulfilling for me and I really enjoyed watching that. You know, one thing that I'm really coming to terms with is that diet is a super complex topic, but food and nutrition should be simple. I, I think not only do we complicate it, but I think they complicate it for us because everything that's being fed, everything that's coming our way. I recently have heard that it takes about four days to get caffeine out of your system. Basically, you go through the withdrawals and then it's out of your system. I've also heard that it takes six to eight days to get sugar out of your system. And for me, I think it's totally accurate because day six and day seven um, from ending the SOSC, sugar, oil, salt, caffeine, on day five, six, and seven, my head was just literally on a swivel. It was in so much pain. So I'm kind of giving you an idea of what to expect if you think you might want to go this way. But it doesn't end there. It starts to subside there. From there, you're going to deal with uh, salt. Salt leaving your system, for a lot of us, that's the hardest one. That one, it says here um, that it takes about 30 days. So when you start departing from salt, that's when the pleasure trap really starts to open up for you, starts letting you go. Because when salt starts leaving your system, you're not craving anything from a fast food restaurant in a box, process, you stop craving that. And then oils, I hear that oils take saturated fats, oils, synthetic oils, like olive oil and things like that, they take three to four months. So I'm coming to the end of my, of my recovery basically to get all these things out of my system. And I can tell you the one thing that is for sure, you know, in life, time is not our friend because, you know, the more time passes, the closer we get to the end, right? But when it comes to food addiction or weight loss or health, when you start eating this way, the more time passes, the better things get, the less, uh, the less that you miss uh, sugar, oil, salts, punchy foods. You stop thinking about them. You stop fantasizing about them because now they're not in your system. So it, there's a process of recovery for you to come the other side. If you treat this as an addict who's going through recovery, know that there's a day where you wake up and there's a rainbow and now you're free from this. And then what's possible is maybe you start telling other people about your journey and maybe you start helping somebody else get inspired to do something with themselves. And I think that's really, really a wonderful thing. At this point, I have zero cravings for sugar, oil, salt, and caffeine, you know, and, uh, however, in awareness, one has to know that an addict is never cured. Staying within the parameters, it's going to be the key for me recognizing that I know there are slippery slopes. So for example, for me to get into rice and beans, 
that's such a cultural thing for me that I know that I probably, if I'm gonna eat rice, I'm gonna probably measure it and put it with a salad. If I'm gonna eat beans, which I eat beans every single day because the, Dr. Joel Furman re recommends that we eat beans every single day to help with our protein count, I eat a cup of beans every single day, but it's a measured cup of bean or it's a sprinkled uh, amount of beans over uh, within a soup. I just made a beautiful cauliflower soup and a vegetable soup that's very creamy and hearty. I, I want to put these things up one day. So I'm going to, again, put a, I'm going to put an episode or create an episode about what I eat in a day and some of the recipes. I want to share those with people because it's not as hard as you think. You just don't know. There are also spices out there that are amazing herbs and spices that come together SOS free that you can add to your food so then you can make your palates happy again. But then your palates are gonna be tasting the real flavor of cauliflower, the real flavor of broccoli, the real flavor of romaine because it's not buried in some dressing that is not good for you. Again, I always say, read the labels and dressings that you eat from the grocery store. I'm making dressings at home with onions, garlic, um, uh, hemp seeds, and I just make, a, you know, you can put vinegar in them, you can put white wine, and these are so punchy and so delicious that your salads are gonna be better than anything that you can actually get from the store without all the chemicals, ingredients, and preservatives that are in pre-made bottled dressings that last months in a bottle. Why are you eating anything that lasts months? Not a good thing. You know, if you were actually hiking somewhere or something like that, and you were gonna go to Kathmandu, because you couldn't have something because it was gonna be perishable and, and not sustain um, its composition, then, then yeah, I can understand that. If you wanna eat trail, uh, trail bars or what are, what are they called? Those little protein bars on a hiking trip because you're in the middle of the bush, I kind of understand that, you know, you take some peanut butter, you take something like that, you eat peanut butter and chia seeds. Those are different ways of nourishing yourself. But when you're at home and you have a grocery store with all this bounty of produce and fruits and vegetables and, and ingredients where you can make your own things, why not choose that for yourself? Why not give yourself the very best? You know, I, I recently spoke to Dr. Goldhammer, who is uh, one of the authors of The Pleasure Trap and uh, one of the authors of the... Um, uh, not well, the author, one of the founders of True North Health Center. I think he is the founder of True North Health Center, which just it happens to be in Santa Rosa, California. And I was talking to him the other day and I, and I was telling him about my story and I told him I want to check in because I want to learn more. I want to do some of the classes that they have there. And I also want to learn, um, I also want to meet the doctors. I always want to, I want to get a physical. I want to do these things, but I was already a couple of months in, so I had already lost the 40 pounds. And, he jokingly said, oh, wow, why didn't, why didn't you come here first and then do that so then we can brag about your, uh, your, you know, your successes? And, and I thought, no, you know what? You still can get to brag about my successes because it, it, it was what he was saying that impacted me in such a positive way. Dr. Goldhammer has been eating this way since he was, I think, 16 years old. Um, if you look at Dr. Goldhammer, I think he's about my age, but he looks like he's about 32. I'm 56. He might even be older than me. I don't know, but he's been eating this way since he was a, a teenager. And he literally practices what he preaches. I did go stay at the True North Health Center. I would highly recommend it. It was a wonderful experience. Not super bougie. So if you're very bougie and you want to go stay at a Four Seasons, go stay at a Four Seasons. But if you want to get well, and you want somebody to coach you through it, it's a great place to go. The doctors are spot on. They understand nutrition, unlike any doctor I've ever met. And they also understand where you're at. So I really want to give them a plug because the experience was super positive and I look forward to going back and possibly doing some either water or juice fasting while I'm there. So I'm interested in learning more about that. I want to give credit to some other people that I want you to research for yourself and um, who have had a big impact in this so far. Besides Dr. Goldhammer, I want to give credit to uh, Dr. Lyle, the co-author of The Pleasure Trap. 
I want to give credit to Chef, uh, Chef AJ. Chef AJ uh, has a wonderful podcast on YouTube uh, with thousands of viewers. Every single day she puts out something new. I've never seen anybody work this hard. But she's literally constantly interviewing somebody in the space because she's also been a food addict who has beat it by literally practicing what she preaches and she's there to help you. Uh, highly recommend for you to watch Chef AJ. It's called Chef AJ Live. It's the name of her channel. Uh, Dr. Goldhammer has been a guest on, on the Ritual podcast with millions of views. And, and these are super credible people. I also like um, Sherry's podcast. And the name of her podcast is The Watering Mouth, or the name of her channel, The Watering Mouth. She does a, a great job. She's also suffered with food addiction and finds herself, finds herself on the other side of it and continuously helps people with the message of eating the right foods to get there. So, you know, when it comes to eating right, um, nutrient dense will always outperform uh, calorie dense foods. And for most of us, what we consume are calorie dense, you know, over 70% of us in this country are overweight. I think over 40% over of those are obese or even to the morbidly obese. So it's an epidemic uh, bigger than any disease that's out there. So we should treat it for what it is. It's very much a disease. And it has already been confirmed that meat and chicken have been linked to multiple types of cancers and even dementia. So people say, you know, if I eat less than 10% of the calories from meat, that kind of debunks the study. Well, the issue is that most people don't eat less than 10% of their calories from, uh, from an animal product. I also, um, I also, you know, find it interesting, and, and again, I've eaten a lot of meat over my life, and I find it interesting that, that we, we can't let that go when meat causes the suffering that it causes. You, you know, we, all we get to see is meat in a package at the store. It's not, it's not that glamorous, you know. I encourage anybody to watch documentaries on how meat is processed, how animals are processed for meat, and the suffering and the killing, the way that that's handled, and or go to a slaughterhouse and experience that. Because I still remember my dad and my grandfather killing a pig in front of me, and if I had to kill that animal myself, I would have never eaten it. And I'm still the same way. If I had to kill anything myself, I wouldn't eat meat. So if I don't have the courage to do that, what makes me feel like I should have... Again, I just won't even go into it. That's my own personal opinion. I respect and I don't want to judge anybody for, for what they consume and what they were taught to consume. But again, we can make our own decisions, right? So we're all grown-ups here. One thing, again, people st still keep asking, where do you get your protein from? I'm not protein deficient between the beans, the vegetables, everything that I eat has protein on it. People ask about sodium. Everything I eat has an amount of sodium that totals the right amount of sodium I need per day. I don't need that much sodium, but people keep asking about sodium when for most of you, again, I'm talking to you, you're fiber deficient. You are fiber deficient. If 97% of the people are fiber deficient, you're more than likely one of them. So consider fiber something that you're missing from your diet and stop asking about you know, carbohydrates and stop asking, we're getting all the carbohydrates we need. We're getting all the, um, all the protein we need. Uh, you know, if you're vegan, what they're saying is, take a B12 every day because you might be B12 deficient and that's not even a guarantee because you might get enough B12. So I'll give you a couple examples here. You know, one of the things in the pleasure trap, think about this. How easy it is for you to chew a Big Mac or a Whopper and swallow. The energy that it takes to chew a Big Mac or a Whopper is very little and just goes down your throat. So, so, does, so does the Cinnabon. The Cinnabon, the good old Cinnabon. Why do they have Cinnabon at the mall? Why does it have that smell? Because they know it's a pleasure trap. 
You're just going to go back and get the Cinnabon and be happy until you swallow it. What happens when you swallow it? I know what happens because I felt it. It feels disgusting. That's what Cinnabon does. That's what Burger King, Burger King does. That's what McDonald's, that's what In-N-Out, that's what Taco Bell. There's always a smell when you get close to their place. So, consider the work that it takes to eat a large bowl of salad, vegetable, you know, beans, legumes, grains. It takes a lot of work. So, path to least resistance, processed foods. So, in the battle of calorie-dense foods versus nutritionally dense foods, I'm going to give you an example of foods that are calorically dense. So, Big Mac, first one. Uh, Whopper, second one. Steaks, chicken, spaghetti, meatballs, olive oil, raviolis, everything down the run. Those are calorically dense foods that we eat for dinner on a daily basis. Then it takes a lot more energy to work and get satiated with these kind of foods. These are nutrient-dense foods. Kale, broccoli, walnuts, chia seeds, leafy greens, beans, etc. It just covers the gamut of fruits and vegetables. The whole rainbow of fruits and vegetables are in the realm of nutrient-dense foods. Now, the thing about nutrient-dense foods is they will fill your stomach in a way that a Whopper cannot. A Whopper will just sit like a lead bomb in the bottom of your stomach. That's why you feel like there's a lead weight in your stomach. When you eat a big bowl of a beautiful lettuce with dressing, with beans, you even throw some grain, you can throw some bulgur, quinoa, anything on it, you're going to be full, but you're not going to be bogged down. You're going to get your stomach to the place where your stretch receptors are going to trigger your brain to tell you you're full. But again, your, your body's going to be so happy because then your gut is going to build these microbiomes that are going to be so healthy for you that are going to go throughout your blood cells and improve anything, even your mood, as you continue to go forward and as you continue to eat this way every single day. So the goal is to get your palate free from the prison of processed foods and SOS. SOS, C, I think caffeine, I'm not a fan. I think, I don't think Dr. Joel Furman is a big fan of caffeine, uh, but I think a lot of nutritionists don't mind caffeine. Caffeine doesn't seem to break a fast for some people and things like that. But for me, caffeine has something really uh, to do with the way that I feel uh, and the anxiety levels that I, that I get from caffeine are quite extreme. I'm trying to catch up here on my notes, make sure that I don't leave anything out. I'm there to, I'm to the closing. Thank you for hanging in there with me. This went long, longer than I thought it would. Wow. In closing, I want to say that no matter where you're at in your journey, there's absolutely no judgment. I've been where you're at. I've been way worse. I can probably assure you of that. Um, so there's zero judgment coming from me. I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening. Uh, this was episode three of the Jerry Pujols Project 2.0 and the reason it's called the Jerry Pujols Project is because I am a work in progress, my own experiment, and I hope that if there's anything that I do that helps you, you let us know and keep us posted. Um, I hope you subscribe, uh, be a part of our community, and as I build this, we continue to have this success together. I love you.